And I think we are live. Welcome back. Welcome to the Friends Validator YouTube channel. And today is such an important day for me personally, because today we will experience the revival of a very old format um, that was like brought to the Cosmos ecosystem. Like, I think, when did we do it for the very first time in 2020, when we were like about to enter a crazy bull market, um, we started a format called Overrated Underrated uh, together with Cryptocito on his YouTube channel back then. And now we are back, Cryptocito. Man, it's been, it's been some time, right? <clears throat> We're back. It's been some time. I just looked up the first message we ever had, basically how we met, which is August 20 of 2020. So that's a long time ago in crypto. Um, but yeah, it's been a wild journey. Obviously, now you guys are killing it with friends. Um, we're both co-founders of Cosmoverse, which became a really big thing. Um, but yeah, man, it's, it's insane how far um, we came over the years and how also Cosmos grew over the years. And I'm just glad that both of us could have a, a big impact on that. So I'm pumped. Pumped. Pumped as well. And uh, you mentioned it when we first did these videos, we were like slightly after DeFi summer 2020. And back then, I don't know how long you are in crypto now, like not you, but the uh, community here is. Back then, we only had Ethereum. We literally had Uniswap. We had some 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 protocols like Aave and Yearn, uh, Yearn Finance was um, the hot shit back then. And now we have so many DeFi protocols across so many different ecosystems. And of course, with Cosmos, we now try to make all of this interoperable now. So it's so crazy to see how the space evolved um, within the past um, two or three years. So yeah, what a, what a crazy journey yeah. it has been so far. And also when we met and like when I started, so I was really pumped when I had my first talk with Jack Zempelin. Uh, which, by the way, after this, so in one and a half hours, I have a live stream with Jack, which is always a, a pleasure to talk to him. Um, but so I remember like when I first talked to Jack, this was before IBC was even live, right? <laughs> now we have like 55 chains implementing IBC, transferring billions of dollars every single month. And it's almost running for two years. Like this month is actually the anniversary. This or next month, I, I don't recall correctly. Um, <clears throat> when uh, Stargate went live, which brought us IBC, I think it was February. Two years ago so crazy journey um as you say now the tide is much higher which is also why i think honestly in in crypto not just in you know not just in cosmos but in crypto we have so many more DeFi applications um actually actual users real revenue and you know especially in cosmos we've been spoiled with airdrops throughout the years with new chains that went live texas like it's all coming together so i'm I'm very, very excited. Um, but yeah, let's get into let's get into the game. Yeah, 100%. And you touched based already on some things you really have to focus on right now. So just to also re-explain this format to you. So it's not about, so when we are judging now uh, some Cosmos projects, we don't want to say, okay, this project is shit or we don't like the project or that we are like huge supporters of project one or two. No, what we want to try to do here is also to bring some thought processes to the table. So, of course, all of this is no, uh, is, uh, no financial advice, but um, we want to basically incentivize you to ask certain questions when starting researching for, for, for a project, if that makes sense. So, yeah. See this as an opportunity to ask uh, certain certain questions when starting your research. And now I'm going to start my screen here. We go. Can you see it? Yes. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Try to optimize it a bit. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, as you can see here, uh, I don't know how to do it, but uh, it's a PDF. So you see already some of the projects that we will discuss today. So with that being said, once again, welcome to our format overrated versus underrated. We are back and uh, let us not hesitate too long. Let us start with the very first project. So Cryptocito, I want to hear your opinion about a project that just entered the cosmos, so to say. Mars protocol. So yeah, maybe you could start with giving us some background here, what the project is doing. And then, yeah, you can continue with uh, your opinion on it. Yeah. So Mars is a, a lending protocol that actually just launched their own chain um, a few days ago. And they just launched their 
um, lending pr uh, protocol on top of Osmosis, right? So they have these outposts on different chains, um, which is really cool. And in fact, they have a strong background basically because they come from the Terra space. And before UST depacked, Mars actually had a TVL of around, I think $350 million or something like that, which is bigger than Osmosis itself is right now. Um, so very promising. I think it did get a lot of hype, you know, leading towards the launch um, and it had a lot of anticipation. Um, so given that a lot of people are already, you know, aware of it and hyped, I wouldn't say it's very underrated, but I would say it's probably slightly underrated because it can drag in a lot of liquidity and new eyeballs into Cosmos and especially into Osmosis as well, um, which is a net positive for Cosmos. So yeah, bullish. But um, I think it also had a lot of hype recently. I want to continue with this um, to, to pick up a couple of things that you've mentioned uh, in the beginning. For me, Mars is very underrated for one very um, significant reason. Because I remember I remember the Terra crash very, very well, as I believe most of the people that experienced that. I mean, this was like a pretty, pretty rough situation for all of us. And when the Terra fall down uh, happened, then all of a sudden people became um, got bullish on Juno and on Osmosis because they said, "Hey, some of the promising Terra projects might move to Juno or to other Rust-based uh, blockchains <clears throat> to build their own applications on top of Juno or Osmosis." But back then, we completely ignored the fact that these chains, such as Mars, but also we will talk about Kujira shortly as well but we forgot about the possibility that these uh, that these projects could also go ahead and build their own chains and this is what we are seeing now so for me mars is very very underrated from the perspective of hey the app chain pieces make sense and it works and so we see the the puzzle pieces right now so i would like to pick your uh, brain on this what your thoughts are on this yeah theory, 100% so and you also see right now in crypto that the app chain thesis is gaining more and more traction, right? Especially after Terra collapse that you mentioned, Terra collapse didn't affect the uptime of Osmo or Atom or any other chain in Cosmos, right? If the Solana chain would have gone down, everything on Solana would have gone down, right? So this app chain idea that every, every application, um, a DEX, an NFT marketplace, a lending protocol, should be or could be on their own chain if it makes sense for them because bootstrapping a validator set is not an easy thing to do but um if there's product market fit high tvl you know brand recognition um and a strong network like it makes sense and as you say i think mars and there's many others that are lined up now x terra also that are launching their own chain so i think it makes sense and from that aspect sure i think but it would be more like the app chain thesis is underrated, which I think is definitely the case. Um, but yeah, for me, Mars as a project itself, as a lending protocol, um, slightly underrated, but also, you know, as I said earlier, given that the hype it had, especially when it launched, I know a lot of people aped in and I told people like, guys, don't ape in. It's going to be highly volatile. <laughs> we had friends validator aped in <laughs> to get into the active set. We bought a shit ton of Mars yesterday. <laughs> but yesterday, not the day it launched, right? Because I know like the minute it launched, a lot of people just aped in. Um, but yeah, that's, I think, uh, you know, also like, the team behind or like the team that's building it is very, very strong. Um, so predominantly, I think it's like incubator. I don't know what's the right terminology by Delphi Labs, right? Which is um, led by um, Jose Maria. So he's, yeah, we're well connected and they have a strong dev team. Um, so yeah, bullish. And they have Thank You. There we go. Thank you, R. So shout out to him as well. But let's move on with the next project, FMOS. Um, so I prepared a take uh, for for FMOS, and as German as I am, I also did. Uh, I also took some notes here and there. So um, some background knowledge for all of you guys. As we all know, FMOS, formerly known as Ethermint, launched last year. I think it was like in May or something. So they messed up a little bit with the with the first launch, but then eventually in early, mid-2022, FMOS successfully launched. And uh, it's an EVM chain that aims to unite two super 
powerful ecosystems, which is the Cosmos ecosystem and Ethereum, and it aims to make it um, very interoperable. And it has gained a lot of traction, of obviously because of the incentivizing tokenomics, but also because of the rec drop, which compensated rug pools on Ethereum, for example, but also rewarded um, Cosmos people that staked Atom, for example. And I also want to mention, before I bring my critiques to the table, I used to be a very big FMOS bull in the beginning, like uh, towards the launch and shortly afterward, I was using FMOS like on a daily basis. Um, but the current market cap is roughly $130 million. And the fully diluted valuation is roughly $430 uh, million. And uh, just to reflect a bit, so... This format is about elaborating on whether a project is overrated or underrated. And personally, for me, if I say a project is underrated, then it's for me a clear buy signal. So I say I want to buy more tokens of this project because of this and this reason. If I say a project is overrated, it doesn't mean that I say I want to dump all of my coins. It just say, it, it just primarily say, hey, I don't need I don't see the necessity to accumulate more tokens so just um just to note that so my question is do i believe i should buy more fmos right now because it's underrated and my answer is no um and before we dive deeper here so they released a roadmap so um crypto i know you are like very familiar with uh with uh with fmos so um can we like touch base on the roadmap uh, real quick? So the FMOS SDK, which is of course crucial, like the EVM extensions and uh, the depth store. So how deep are you into that before I talked way too long? I mean, I don't know the roadmap on top of my head, um, but it's it's a quite technical roadmap. And I think also to touch um, on what you said, um, I think in the beginning, FMOS had a lot of hype because they build something that no one else had, right? Which is the EVM on a Cosmos chain. Um, and so far they haven't really delivered upon the promises of like building up out the eco ecosystem, right? I mean, you can be very, very bullish on Ethermint or now the FMOS SDK, but another thing, and maybe we can talk later a little bit about Kanto as well, <clears throat> which I'm just now doing my, my, my deeper research on. But another thing is like building out the ecosystem, attracting users, attracting liquidity and volumes, right? And FMOS has not met the expectations here yet, right? Does that mean that it's over for FMOS? Definitely not. Um, but they definitely have a lot of upside potential when it comes to that, right? Now, when you talk about the roadmap, I think the roadmap is basically the result of the thought process from the FMOS team to say, hey, we see massive adoption for Ethermint as a framework for Cosmos chains to be to implement the EVM. We see that on Kronos, Kava, um, Kanto. We see that also on Bera chain that is now coming up. So that framework is being taken by these projects. And obviously, you know, that's the open market, that's open source, that's crypto. That we love that. We want to actually embrace that. But FMOS doesn't capture any value of that, right? So I think from now on, the roadmap is to say, hey, um, we provided this public good, but now we actually moving forward, we want to focus on FMOS itself as a competitive chain in the EVM on Cosmos space. And that's, I think, where the roadmap shows um, <clears throat> a little bit of the, the own flavor that, that FMOS will have uh, compared to you know the ones that I just mentioned. But yeah, if you have the roadmap prepared, you can just... Go through something. Yeah, but before we do that, also we will definitely talk about Kanto, um, like during this in, uh, during this live stream. Uh, but you mentioned a couple of things. So you also mentioned you also mentioned this first mover advantage. If there is something like a first mover advantage um, when you started to talk about FMOS, and there's one thing I really want to highlight here, also in regards of liquidity, because EVM chain. So what what is the most important thing for an EVM chain in my perspective? In my perspective, the most important thing for an EVM chain is liquidity and, tra uh, and trading volume. So EVM chains, for me personally, serve primarily for DeFi. We saw this on Ethereum in the very beginning. We see this now with Aurora getting um, big in the uh, um, near ecosystem. We uh, saw this also with Phantom and with many, many other examples. But um, the thing is that I think... FMOS did like one slight 
slight um, slight uh, strategic mistake here. Um, and now other projects that will basically play the same playbook as FMOS in the beginning can learn from that. And I'm talking about the tokenomics here in the beginning, because in the beginning, when we started to receive the FMOS airdrop, what was the best thing about FMOS? Staking FMOS, because it was so rewarding. But the problem was that providing liquidity, let's say, on a dep on, of, on FMOS like Diffusion, was not that rewarding. So when I just went ahead and said, hey, I take my FMOS, I stake my FMOS, I earn the rewards, then I earned like a higher APR compared to when I went over to Diffusion or to Kronos or whatever and uh, provided liquidity. And this is, of course, not very ideal because first of all if i want to provide liquidity i need another token i need a so-called token pair and yeah why should i buy a volatile token like the diff token or uh, the chronos token so there was not the big in incentive for me from a financial perspective to put in my tokens into such a pool and the other thing was of, of course there's always a smart contract risk so providing liquidity is much riskier than staking and therefore the liquidity is kind of constrained right now in the DeFi ecosystem. And then another thing we really have to talk about before diving deeper into the roadmap, the Nomad hack. The Nomad hack was, yeah, this was like not so cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, did you suffer actually from the Nomad hack? Uh, no, I actually didn't, um, but, or maybe like very, very little, but not really uh, in, a, in a big way. But um, yeah, I think the thing is that um, FMOS, you know, had a lot of hype initially because, you know, it was the, the bear market savior for all of us with this nice airdrop, right? They had a, a quite high evaluation in the beginning. But I think, again, it comes back to can you attract applications to build on, on FMOS? And I think the original idea was to say, okay, we launch this chain now and we target actually Ethereum developers, right? Because that's actually the point of it is right to, to bring over um, EVM um, applications onto, onto FMOS. Um, but that didn't really work out, right? And then you see Kanto kind of coming around um, that are actually coming, as far as I understand, like the backstory also of Scott Lewis, who's um, kind of like the main person behind it. They have a strong Ethereum background, right? So they're actually the ones from the Ethereum community to now come to Cosmos thanks to Ethermint. Um, but they obviously um, have a different approach, right? Um, and it's a different sales pitch. And they also just launched basically with an application from the get-go. Um, and I think FMOS just launched as this general smart contract platform. Um, in the beginning, we did have some, some hype around diffusion, but that never really gained massive traction. Um, and then, as you said, the, the bridge hack, obviously, that was a big thing. So I think it's a, a sequence of events that led to kind of like FMOS not being able to attract a lot of depths. But um, again, you know, I, I would never say it's dead now just because the past few months the price has gone down and the TVL hasn't exploded. Um, you know, all it takes is just one application to to move over and that's it. So, no, I'm yeah. also not saying that FMOS is dead or so, but um, you mentioned the liquidity. So the result of all of these events that you just touched on resulted in the fact that FMOS's TVL, like in terms of DeFi activity, is at... $883,000, so below $1 million. So there's less than a million dollars in FMOS's DeFi ecosystem. And the seventh largest step on FMOS has only $20,000 in TVL, which is costland. Um, so yeah, the liquidity is extremely constrained, which is also a risk, I guess, because you can do crazy things like wash trading and stuff very easily and price manipulations and stuff. Um, but I don't want to dive too deep into that but yeah my question is like because we we talk about overrated underrated is an e for DeFi ecosystem worth a hundred how much like is a chain with a DeFi ecosystem that is worth like eight hundred thirty three thousand dollars worth in terms of uh, tvl is this ecosystem worth 130 million dollars in terms of market cap and roughly 430 million if you talk about a fully diluted valuation so this is like for me the key question here i'm not saying fmos is dead or so won't survive the bear market or has no chance to come back but this is like the question i ask myself is is this worth 130 million dollars at the moment 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I think, honestly, um, if you just look at, at, at the numbers that you said, right, the TVL, and obviously that's a no-brainer answer is to say, of course, it should be worth much less. But you also have to take into account that, you know, FMOS shipped Ethermint, finished and shipped Ethermint. Um, they actually, you know, I mean, you could also like kind of say that Kava, Kronos, even Kanto, right, are indirectly linked to the launch of FMOS in that sense, because they just forked the code base, which is totally fine. But um, if you then think about, okay, how does crypto work, right? Crypto doesn't care about rational explanations. Otherwise, Dogecoin would not be <laughs> in the top se seven or top six. So in that sense, I would say, as it is innovative and um, has uh, you know, a strong product market fit, obviously, it's still underrated in that sense, um, but I would be rather neutral right now um, and would like to see first how they manage to attract the developers and applications to, to get liquidity, volume, and TVL, because that's super important, right? Um, especially nowadays. But also you have to think like FMOS is not a DeFi chain, right? FMOS is a general purpose smart contract chain. Basically anything can be on FMOS. So yeah, it's, it's going to take time. And um, yeah, we have to wait and see, I guess. Yeah, and I definitely take your points into account. Um, just like slightly touching, of course, on the roadmap because this wouldn't be like um, this wouldn't be like too professional if we just ignore the roadmap that they just published. I want to keep it very short. They pointed out three crucial things, which is again the FMOS SDK, uh, the Dapp Store, and EVM extensions. Like the EVM extensions will allow smart contracts to be to yeah to support cooperability with uh, Cosmos modules. So Dapps can make smart contract calls to communicate with other chains, transfer funds between ch uh, chains, and so on and so forth. So I think this is like extremely cool. Um, but then there are like two things that are confusing me a little bit. Like for example, with the Cosmos SDK, you mentioned that they are that they were pioneering uh, Ethermint, which is very very cool. Um, however. I don't see really the necessity. So what the FMOS SDK does, pretty similar to the Cosmos SDK, it will allow developers to set up their own EVM chains. And for me, the question in the room right now is whether we need that many EVM chains in the near future, because like most of them are lacking in liquidity. And I understand that EVM chains also should fulfill a general purpose. But for me, like one of the many, 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 like the biggest... Um, the biggest thing on an EVM chain is definitely DeFi. Um, so I don't see the necessity to have like 20 more EVM chains that eventually use the FMOS SDK. And of course, you also have adoption hurdle to overcome here. And the Dapp store uh, should make it easier to find Dapps in FMOS, but also beyond like in the general Cosmos ecosystem. And also there, I'm trying to wrap my head around whether I've ever had the feeling, hey, I need a Dapp store to find all the exciting depths on on fmos because i lost the overview or because i lost the overview in the cosmos ecosystem so i know that i can use osmosis i know where i can find injective and a lot of other DeFi protocols are like struggling right now so i don't know i'm not let me add one one thing to this yeah. i think what's very important to understand is the addressable market for evm chains is huge right bnb the BNB ecosystem and Ethereum itself have by far the most amount of users, liquidity volumes, right? TVL by far, right? Like I think combined they have well over 1.3, 1.4 million daily active users. So I think there is a giant pie of um, EVM, you know, use cases and users and liquidity. And FMOS so far hasn't managed to get any of that pie. Um, Kanto is seemingly getting some of that pie, but I think this is coming later on the list, right? Um, but still for Cosmos chains that implement the EVM, I think we're just getting started and we actually see more chains coming up because I think that is severely underrated, the EVM and Cosmos, but that's just my opinion. So I say underrated, uh, I say overrated and you say underrated? You mean EVM chains in Cosmos or FMOS. specifically FMOS? FMOS. I would say I would I would be neutral. Neutral. Okay. Fairly, fairly rated. Okay, perfect. Then and by the way, also disclosure, yeah. right? Like FMOS, they used to be um the channel sponsor uh for quite some time. 
Um, so I guess a lot of people would have expected me to be uh, shilling them, but we have to be realistic, right? And they have not, you know, managed to to onboard a lot of users and liquidity. But um, I'm optimistic. I, you know, I know the team quite well. Um, they all also come to customers every year, so they are definitely shipping and building stuff, and they're committed. Um, but yeah, we have to wait and see. Yeah, I think um, you can put it that way. And of course, I also respect the FMOS team a lot. And again, um, I believe in FMOS long term. But yeah, if you ask me right now if I should buy FMOS, I would say personally, I'm not buying any FMOS. But yeah, let's move on with the next project. Um, we talked about Mars. Now let's talk about Kujira. Again, formerly a project on Terra. And now they are joining the Interchain. You picked this project. So. Um, yeah, what's your opinion uh, on Kujira and could you give us some background here? I forgot that I picked it, but yeah, so the thing is, I'm not fully, um, um, knowledge, you know, I'm not really knowledgeable about Kujira. All I know is that they are, they have a very strong community, right? Um, and they're also ex Terra, um, they now launched their own chain. Um, they also launched a algorithmic stable coin, which obviously everybody still has PTSD from, from UST, but um, USK seems to work fine. There's a lot of discussions and debates around their um, source code, which as of my understanding right now is closed source, um, unless they open it, I don't know. But yeah, um, a little bit controversy in the past few weeks and months, um, but they do have a big community, which we haven't touched upon yet, but I think also in FMOS's case, FMOS obviously has a big community as well. Um, so Kujira has a big community. They have a lot of DeFi uh, products that they're building. Um, I don't know if on top of my head, I don't know if you have the numbers, but uh, in terms of DVL and usage, but um, yeah, overall, I, I'm not exposed. I don't have any Kuji, um, so I can't tell you anything about a token, but um, from what I hear, um, I, would, I would just say I, I'm neutral because there's a lot of hype and at the same time, just a lot of FUD. So I don't know what to make out of that. What do you think? Um, I'm actually trying to figure out how to do it like in full screen. Is it in full screen now? Now it's in full screen, yes. Now it's in full screen. Okay, thanks, God. Um, yeah, so actually I don't have a super strong opinion on Koji. The only thing that I've really ha kept a close eye on was um, that uh, Koji, I think they keep their, um, their, their, their code non-open source or like disclosed or I don't know how to they keep they keep the code secret or something because they don't want anyone to steal it but correct me if I'm wrong but I think I've heard that yeah I think that's the case like it's closed source um, which makes it hard obviously for people to trust the code right if you can't see the code how can you trust the code there might be a secret backdoor or whatever right like that's the concern around it and I know Jacob has been very vocal about it oh yeah um and many others as well. So, yeah. Let's put it like this. It's super exciting in that sense because um, you mentioned it. Of course, there's like somewhat a risk involved. But on the other hand, it could be also something new, like generally how people think about this open source versus closed source game. Um, our friend uh, Lukas has brought up some interesting ideas on Twitter very recently. So, yeah, um, yeah like maybe, it, maybe it's like, from one perspective, a good thing that we like see like now more discussions around uh, open source and that we maybe have some rational views no, here. I think, okay, I think I there, there's two uh, levels to it, right? One, one is that you have um, the closed source versus open source debate, which is obviously I'm totally for open sourcing everything because that's how you can really, you know, independently verify and, and create trust in the code. Um, but another, another thing is also, um, you know, li licensing and who can copy the code, right? And we've seen actually Uniswap has been the pioneer in that. Uni V2 was entirely open source, had no license, nothing. Sushi came around, copied the code, packed a token to it. This was before the Unicoin was even live. Packed a token to it, had better incentives, and everybody, you know, made it easy for people to migrate their LP positions onto SushiSwap. And they, you know, they took over a lot of market shares from, from Uniswap. So when UniV3 came out, um, they had basically a, a business license or whatever it's called that basically prohibits 
projects to just copy paste their code, but you could still see and verify the code base, right? So you can still see it's legit. There's no backdoors. There's no um, secrets, uh, whatever implemented. And I think that's a good compromise. Um, as of my understanding, like in hindsight, that's also what the FMOS team kind of like was thinking about to say like, you know, that might have been a smarter way to first build up traction and then fully, you know, remove the license for others to also like launch their products, whatever. But in Kuchi's case, there, as of my understanding at least, and if there's anybody in the audience that knows better, like please correct us. But in Kuchi's case, I think they're entirely closed source, which as of my understanding, they're reasoning that competition is there and they don't want to get front run by anybody. But I kind of like, I'm not fully buying that. I don't know. So I'm, 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 I'm a little bit, that's why I'm like a little bit distanced um, because you never know what can happen, right? We've seen what happened with UST. Um, and if there's any like backdoor implemented a code that people can't even see, yeah, tough one. Tough one. Yeah, um, yeah. I also don't want to um, to um, put a too strong opinion on that. I am I'm taking like the neutral joker here. I'm yeah, doing I'm the Cito now. I'm neutral. <laughs> Next one, Stride. That's my take. Um, I really want to talk about Stride because um, I'm actually a pretty um, big Stride fan. And uh, there are like so many things you could talk about. So let's talk like firstly what Stride is, is doing. So they will be one of the first projects alongside Neutron, Quicksilver, this USDC issuance chain. And I hope I didn't forget one. But uh, definitely it will be like one of the first projects to leverage interchain security. And they are a liquid staking protocol. So you can go ahead and stake your liquid, stake your items there. And this is how you have more freedom and more flexibility with your atom position since you can go ahead and for example still provide liquidity with your liquid stake tokens or you can also eventually dump them if you want so that's a pretty cool and crucial thing and um, we will also talk about interchain security in a second but for me what gets like super super clear with stride is they have an immediate product market fit because in my view, I know this has been pretty controversial since Atom 2.0, but liquid staking is a very, 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 very elegant way to, um, to fix Atom's problematic tokenomics, if you want to say it in a, in a neutral manner. So the thing right now is that the hub inflates Atom like crazy to give you an incentive to stake Atom. Because if you stake Atom right now, you don't earn that much money from fees. So the idea behind staking is you stake your, your cryptocurrencies and then you earn and then you earn a money generated from fees on the chain. But there aren't that many fees generated on the Cosmos Hub that you could earn like, I don't know, what's the Atom APR right now, like 16 or 17%. So you wouldn't earn these percentages for, for staking Atom. So a lot of this comes from pure inflation. And I think that's not super sustainable. But if we now go ahead and say, okay, we have consumer chains like Stride, and you could go ahead and stake your atoms there, which still makes it possible to secure the hub with that. But because you are doing liquid staking, you are having DeFi activity on these consumer chains. And this, on the other hand, generates a lot of fees. And these fees that will uh, that will get generated go will go back to people who stake Atom natively on the hub since the consumer chains are borrowing the security from the Cosmos hub. And I think this is such an elegant way to kind of compensate what's going on right now in terms of inflation. So we have a clear product market fit for that. And of course, people always want to do liquid staking to have more capital efficiency. So yeah, what's your, what's your um, view on this? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things. So I think, first of all, <clears throat> liquid staking in Cosmos has very strong product market fit, as you said, um, and not just for Atom, but every coin in Cosmos, right? Osmo, especially FMOS, right? Like if you stake FMOS, um, currently you have extremely high APRs, um, around 100%. But imagine you could not, you, you, won't, you wouldn't have to choose between um, staking FMOS, but you could also reuse it somewhere else, right? We talked earlier about the ecosystem right now, there's not too much. 
But if there's a killer application, you could, through liquid staking, use FMOS on another application, provide liquidity with it, or whatever, right? So um, you just have an additional source of um, uh, yield, and you don't have to choose between staking or DeFi, basically. Um, so product market fit is clear. I think they also did great in, with their launch, right? They kind of like came out of nowhere where, you know, Quicksilver and P-Stake um, and even Staffy have been around for quite some time. Stride just came, they launched, boom, done, right? And they accrued like $10 million in their um, Atom and um, ST, ST Atom Atom pool on Osmosis. So that was great. First mover here. And um, with that, they also launched their own chain which as you said, they're now migrating um, to become a consumer chain, um, which is also great for Atom tokenomics, as you explained. Um, one thing I'm really excited about is to see once they implement um, Zaki's liquid staking module, because that would mean that if you have your Atoms already staked, which I guess most of us have, currently you basically have to unstake your Atom, wait 21 days where you don't earn staking rewards, or you have to go and buy a new Atom and then stake them through a stride. With the liquid staking module from Zaki, which is, uh, I guess, coming soon, um, you can just liquefy your already existing staked positions, which is really cool, right? So yeah, I think that's a combination of things that makes it successful. And as of my understanding, Stride, they also want to build out an ecosystem of liquid staked assets eventually also an index token backed by liquid staked assets or by a basket of assets, which is also really cool. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of things also in combination with Mars, right, with other lending protocols or UMI, for example, where you can then implement these assets natively and earn additional yield. So yeah, I think underrated, to be honest. Yeah, totally. And uh, I think that we, we totally agree here on... Uh, on that Stride has a product market fit, 100%. And let's talk about the numbers now. Because Stride has um, currently a market cap of, I think, $3.8 million and a fully diluted one of, I think, $43 million, something like that. I looked it up yesterday, so the numbers might have changed. But you see, like, $3.8 million is not a lot of money um, for, for such a project, especially if it has such a strong product market fit. And I also don't uh, I also don't think that a fully diluted valuation of $40 million is too crazy. Um, of course, we're still in crypto, so these numbers are mostly a little bit crazier compared to traditional finance. Um, but uh, still, I think you, you get my point here. I think uh, for a project that has, obviously, a product market fit, um, that is leveraging something very incredible, which is interchain security, which brings this innovative aspect also uh, into perspective. If the Cosmos thesis plays out completely, Stride has an, has a super huge advantage here. Uh, Quicksilver as well, but maybe Quicksilver is a topic for another episode. But uh, yeah, these are my my thoughts here. The only thing I would say could could concern me a little bit is whether there is enough incentive for holding the stride tokens in terms of governance like if the atom token um benefits more from the stride zone than the stride token does ben uh, will benefit from the stride zone like from the product itself that's the only concern i have here right now but otherwise for me um it's a clear signal i want to be more exposed to Liquid staking protocols, leveraging interchain security. So yes, underrated. <clears throat> yeah, and I also think um, the Stride token value accrual um, is predominantly probably like just the chain security of Stride, which I'm interested to see how they will play out when they migrate, like how that value accrual mechanism will change because then the validator set of Stride will basically change their roles, right? They will change their hats with the validators of Atom. So Atom validators actually produce blocks on Stride, um, which I'm excited to see how that, how that also impacts the, the token value accrual mechanism for the STRD uh, coin. Um, but yeah, I think governance actually is, is probably the, the killer application for Stride, uh, for the Stride coin here, because in the future, the community will just, you know, adjust the parameters. There's going to be a lot more features. There's going to be a lot more assets, index tokens, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, probably also coming up. Uh, I just saw a question 
from Altcoin Facts regarding the list, risks of liquid staking in general. And I think that's a very important question and also to, important to understand that there are definitely risks. Um, we also see that right now in the Ethereum world, right, we have Lido that has the lion market share of liquid staking. And if they would collapse or if there would be a, a bug or, you know, a, an application that would turn Lido into something like Anchor did for UST, there could be a, a death spiral at some point, right? Or what if it depacks? Like there's a lot of questions, but I think first of all, all Cosmos liquid staking providers have been in the space for many years. There's also a lot of lessons learned. If you look at Stride, P-Stake um, as well from the persistence team, um, Quicksilver as well, right? They're absolute OGs, so they know their stuff. Um, so first of all, they have a lot of experience and know-how and lessons learned from others. And second, we have variety, right? And we have competition, which most other ecosystems don't have. They have one, maximum two, or maybe three providers. But in Cosmos, we have many, many different providers, right? Eventually, Lido itself will also launch on Neutron, their liquid staking solution. So yeah, I think the, the variety mitigates the systemic risk. But I think it's still not 100% clear how risky it actually is. So, yeah, I'll leave that yeah. for everyone to make their own dis conclusions about that. Yeah, also just wanted to pick up this comment because I also think it's very important. Also, there's a risk in terms of uh, centralization and power shift because uh, liquid staking providers also have um, the power to decide which validators also have more access to uh, the staked atoms. So, um, yeah, um, this is like also a question here. Um, but yeah, again, as you mentioned, there will be like not only like it would be like super worrying if we would have only Stride. Then I would say, oh, guys, calm down with the adoption of Stride. But that's not the case. Uh, you mentioned there's also Quicksilver. We have persistence with PSEC and so on. Um, and another thing I also want to mention here is I think the future won't be the case that you do liquid staking only to get this elephant out of the room. I think you will have a variety. So I think that you have people using um, using Atom natively on the hub in order to stake it, uh, which gives you a higher APR. But um, you split it up also to some liquid staking solutions to firstly mitigate your personal risk and also um, to be able to have like at least one position or like a part of your atom position that you can dump if you need capital quickly. So in this scenario, you can go ahead and say, okay, I have my portfolio. I have like, let's say 2000 atom, 1000 atom. I stake it natively on the hub and then 500, I stake it on Stride and another 500 on Quicksilver, for example. So I imagine the future like this and especially for large, like for, for big investors, this is like um, super important to have uh, this flexibility. So this is how I imagine it. Um, I don't know how you imagine it. Yeah. Yeah. Very similar. There's also a comment uh, from Keegnomics about, <clears throat> the team Kujira interview and actually that's something that's in the works so I'm going to interview the Kujira team in uh, I guess a couple of weeks so that's that's in the works but yeah regarding liquid staking fully agree and the more options the better to be honest so actually here especially here we should embrace competition because it actually mitigates risks and that's super important 100% and now let's move on with the next topic uh, or with the next project so to say sommelier so I think you. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think you. You. You picked this project. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, I. I'm not too familiar with it anymore. So please uh, guide us yeah. around. So Sommelier, I, I told you I would like to talk about it because I think it's been in stealth for a long time. Um, I also think it's probably more of a bull run product than a you know in the bear market. So last year there wasn't much hype around it. Um, actually, when it launched, there was a little bit of hype, and then obviously the coin was distributed. Um, it dried out a little bit after you know it dumped like everything else in the market. But they've been building secretly in the background and released the first vaults and attracted. I don't know what's actually the, the TVL, but I think it's approaching 10 million or even more than that. So they are gaining traction, um, and what it basically does is it's um, implementing um, also a version of the gravity bridge which enables them to automize strategies for DeFi on the biggest protocols in DeFi 
that we have, right? Such as Aave, Compound, or Uniswap. So you can set um, your, your strategies. Um, this can be an individual, it can be institutions. Um, and then you would, um, yeah, automate basically to, to maximize your yield through lending protocols or LPing, right? And it would just, you can also set parameters. You can say you can rebalance it. There's like automatization tools that you have. Um, so yeah, it's basically just a, a DeFi. It's a real yield optimizer or real yield, um, yeah, um, engine that you can deploy on Ethereum DeFi, which is where most of the activities happening right now, obviously. And I think it's very interesting. And um, yeah, so I think product wise, severely underrated. Um, if you look at the sum price, it's been on a bit of a run recently. Um, so I don't know if that's, I don't know what's the fair valuation for that. But um, in total, I would say severely underrated. Yeah, and uh, we did not even dive too deep into the team. Uh, I think oh, yeah. uh, Zeki and Jack are doing it, and I think this is as Cosmos OG-ish as it can get, right? So I mean, um, it's not only Zeki and Jack. It's also Deborah, the founder of Gravity Bridge. Oh, yeah. Federico has also been heavily involved in the beginning, obviously not anymore, as of my understanding. Um, so Federico, co-founder of FMOS, Deborah, co-founder of Gravity Bridge, Jack and Zaki, that are absolute OGs. Um, when they launched, um, they they then did a, a reverse fundraiser similar to Osmosis, where they raised, I think, $25, 26000000 million and um, set up a giant team, right? Um, branding is nice. The narrative is good. Um, TVL is flooding in. So I think they're, they're gaining traction now. They're gaining steam. And um, yeah, I think later on in my interview with, with Jack, I'm also going to ask him about the the hottest and latest, but Saki's been the most active, at least from my perception on Twitter, to talk about some. And um, yeah, excited to see how how that plays out. And hopefully, this is the killer application for for you know asset management on Ethereum, on a Cosmos chain. So there we go. So underrated, right? I think severely underrated. Severely underrated. Okay, yeah. Like from top of my head, it also feels underrated. Yeah, but don't uh, nail me down on that. But yeah, I would also say also in regards to the team, severely yeah, underrated. Hype you up. <laughs> hype, hype me up. Yeah, now um, Apollo, I have to apologize because now I have to leave the full screen because I don't know why, but it, I, I can't read my notes when I uh, keep the full screen on. So I have to uh, quit the full screen for a couple of moments because I have to look into my notes because Kanto is a thing where I really dive deeper yesterday and I really took notes and i really looked around the space because kanto has been pretty weird in my eyes uh and um yeah I, I really needed to do some research here so first of all i want to mention here that i first heard of kanto back in october 2022 at the staking summit a friend of mine who um works at um, staking rewards said hey <clears throat> keep an eye on Kanto, super underrated and well he was right uh if i would have bought Kanto back then it would be a nice four or five x in a bear market not bad um but anyway, um, to to talk more about Kanto, um, it's an FMOS fork, so they forked FMOS and are literally playing the same playbook as FMOS. Uh, so again, we have an EVM chain that really focuses on um, on DeFi activity. Um, so they have a huge TVL and everything. And I heard people saying, "Hey, Kanto is everything is doing everything right." What FMOS is not doing right. So you could argue, hey, Yuri, you mentioned that you are not bullish on FMOS or that you think that FMOS is overrated. Now you must be a Kanto bull. And I can tell you what, not at all. There are so many red flags if you dive deeper into Kanto. So the first thing, like, again, Kanto is a pretty young project. And... The thing is, Kanto has right now a market cap of $300 million and a fully diluted valuation of $655 million. But the extreme thing for me here is, let's ignore market cap and fully diluted valuation. Kanto has an extremely high TVL of $198 million. Um, 
And again, Kanto was basically born during a bear market and they attracted TVL of $198 million. Like getting or like attracting that much liquidity in such a short period of time in a bear market is, let's put it like this, pretty impress impressive. Um, but the liquidity is not very well distributed. Um, so there are actually just two debts, which is Kanto Dex and Kanto Lend. So, so to say in-house debts. And they are like, It, it uh, attracted all of the TVL. And another thing is, in the past 25 hours, the trading volume has been at $154 million. dollars. And according to this data, Kanto has a higher trading volume than Avalanche and Optimism combined. And people want to explain me like, this, all of this happened completely organically within a couple of months in a bear market. And then I also talked to some people I really trust in the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, I didn't find sources that really prove that, but there aren't, let's put it like this, there aren't many addresses uh, controlling um, the fully diluted supply of Kanto. There are just a few. And um, by the way, Kanto has more trading volume compared to Uniswap in example. So just that we like, bring this into perspective and this is the reason because like if if the liquidity wasn't that high i would say hey that's that sounds cool but because of this rapid growth it really sounds fishy to me um it really there are like a couple of red flags here for me um and to be more concrete all of this sounds a little bit like wash trading to me to be very honest Yeah, I mean, I haven't done any deeper research and I heard allegations that they do wash trading, but I don't know. I haven't researched it, so I can't comment on this. What I think to their credit, what they have done amazing is, you know, and it goes back to earlier when we talked about FMOS, they gained a lot of awareness and traction very fast, right? And you can even like, even if they would have wash traded in the beginning, and even if right now 90% is wash trading, right? The volume is still much, much higher than FMOS ever was, right? So to their credit, they killed it. I hear everybody talking about Kanto from bankless to crypto YouTubers, like everyone, right? Outside of Cosmos. So I think that's a net positive for Cosmos. And again, I think competition should be embraced. Um, there's also a lot, of, um, a lot of discussions right now and some tribal things between uh, not even like FMOS and Kanto community, but rather people that just look at the numbers and say, yeah, FMOS is shit, Kanto for the win, right? Um, but I think both communities actually respect each other. And um, they're, you know, going back to everything, the, the EVM pie is big enough for, for all of these guys to succeed. Um, but I think the way Kanto differentiates a little bit to FMOS, for example, would be that Kanto also launched with a compound fork, um, as of my understanding, um, from the get-go. So they have a clear application from the beginning. I also think they're more like um, an app chain in that sense that they are not just an EVM chain, but actually an EVM DeFi or lending chain. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you look at the DEX, I was just there uh, yesterday or something. Um, it has cool UX, to be honest. Like it's, it's fun, it's cool. It's their own branding, their own design not just a copycat from, from somewhere else, um, unless I'm missing something here. But yeah, I mean, I can't comment on the wash trading stuff. Um, the, the growth has been insane, which is always a little bit uh, fishy. But as of my understanding also, I don't know if you have insights on that, they don't have any fees right now on the, on the decks, right? So it's just fee-less trading, which obviously invites to wash trade. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I have to do my research, to be honest. Yeah, so this is all what I found out like yesterday because like I ignored this thing for quite some time. But um, yeah, I also want to respond uh, to uh, a comment from iConfex. How did they kill it? They forked FMOS. FMOS is the great one. Like I agree on that. Like no one, like whoever is saying that Kanto killed FMOS or so, I think that's completely nuts to, to say something like this. And uh, way too, too early as well as saying that FMOS is somewhat dead or so. That's not the truth. And again, Kanto is still a very young project. It experienced a rapid growth. No doubt about that, but again, there are so many red flags for me, and there aren't that many, there aren't any red flags uh, in regards to this with FMOS, just to put it like this. So um, 
yeah, like I find Kanto very fishy, and um, this is the reason why I think it's overrated at this point. It's overrated and overhyped. That's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, from from the noise I hear, and also just uh, also to move on, I think for me, from what it sounds, it's also overrated. But maybe I'm missing something, and there is a giant community on some platform that I have not looked into. But um, I, you know, we'll see. Time will tell. So I say overrated. What are you saying? What is your opinion? Also overrated. Overrated. Okay. Then next one. Injective. You had Eric on the show very recently. Tell us. Yeah. Can you give I us had, some alpha? I had round two with Eric. Um, very committed uh, guy, obviously, and very committed team. They just announced a massive ecosystem fund with leading VCs and companies in crypto that will probably drive a lot of adoption and awareness for Cosmos, not just Injective. Um, and it's cool. Like Injective has traction with Helix, which is their um, order book decks. Um, they have a lot of DeFi applications that are now migrating. Um, Astroport is also an Xterra dex that is now launching on Injective. Astroport had a TVL of 1.7 billion at the peak before UST depacked. So there's a lot of traction. Also the mysterious Project X that was um, that won the award at Cosmoverse for the most, what do you call it, the most promising uh, project or most hyped project that's coming up. So Project X coming out of stealth, um, more traction with um, users, real volumes, and um, yeah, UX is smooth. It's also implementing uh, their version of the Gravity Bridge. Um, so yeah, um, which means you have full EVM or, or Ethereum compatibility. Um, so yeah, I think Injective, um, not severely, but quite underrated. Yeah. I would say the same. Uh, by the way, we are like um, doing another interview with Injective as well. And uh, the interview will take place on the day of the launch of Astroport, which will be the 22nd of February, actually. So nice. not too, uh, too far away from now. Um, and yeah, I, I would say the same thing. I wouldn't say it's like severely, over, uh, um, severely underrated or so, since they also have quite a decent um, market cap and stuff. And uh, a lot of people uh, talk about it. They have a very strong community, one of the strongest communities in Cosmos, actually. Many people forget about that. Um, yeah, th th the only thing right now that many people like might not know is, um, for example, we are also running infrastructure on Injective. And um, in the beginning, like a couple of months ago, Injective used to be a little bit more centralized because they didn't support that many validators compared to other projects, but they changed that. So Injective became more decentralized, which is cool. But um, yeah, some projects, including us, are like uh, struggling a little bit right now from a validator perspective um, since we got uh, jailed a couple of times, but we were not the only ones. I think also Cosmos Station got jailed a couple of times. So there were some problems, but besides that, I think Injective is a great product, um, especially with the focus on um, that they're basically also trying to do the same thing as inject uh, as DYDX saying, hey, we're like building a, a product here that is like, that speaks completely in favor of the app chain thesis. So yeah, this is the reason why I'm extremely excited about uh, Astroport and the future of Injective. Um, should we move on? Yeah, I just wanted to say Stakes Cedar didn't get chilled. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I know. I, t I I talked I talked to to Jonas about it. Like I was like texting him, "Hey, how are you doing it? Are you like uh, running extra infrastructure?" And he said, uh, "No, we are just doing this and that." And I said, "Oh yeah, we are also doing that." It's for me right now. It's such a mysterium because we're like actually doing the same thing you are doing, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I talked a lot to that. Um, I talked a lot about that with Jonas and Sergey very recently, actually. Yeah, but I also wanted to add, um, I think Injective is um, <clears throat> the leader when it comes to also, um, how do you say that in English, like coining the term um, for uh, sector specific chains. So they're basically expanding app chains to sector chains. Um, Say has been talking a lot about this, um, but Say is not live yet. Injective is already live since over a year. So I think we're going to see a lot more stuff an objective they're also one of the fastest cosmos chains with finality within a second um fmos by the way as well 
Um, I think one between one and two seconds, an objective is one second, which is also very underrated, to be honest, to achieve such high finality on a tournament-based chain, right? Which is almost competitive to Avalanche or Solana. So super fast, sector-specific DeFi, and we're going to see a lot more applications and hopefully TVL liquidity also flooding over from the Ethereum world, um, which is always a net positive for, for Cosmos. And uh, last thing also to like, maybe there are some devs in the crowd right now. Um, Injective is doing a hackathon right now, an online hackathon. Mm -hmm. I think applications will be closed in one week or so, but uh, in total, there are bounties to win worth in total $1.5 million. So if you want to make some extra cash in the bear market, this is a great opportunity. So yes, also, for me, also undervalued. I think also Kanto has a virtual hackathon right now where people can, I think just go on the Kanto profile and just check them out i think they also have something going on but yeah <laughs> yeah full disclosure here um let's promote all kinds of hackathons yeah and they are also at east denver so if you guys are right now at east denver or want to like i think it starts next next week um go and say hi um next Under project yes. so underrated yeah underrated yeah. underrated perfect we are on one page here oh. is Interchain security. Here we go with the little bit more controversial topics, I would say. I think there are like some controversial opinions on interchain security. So go ahead. What do you think of interchain security? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, interchain security. I think now it's the first version is called replicated security, which means the whole Atom validator set produces blocks <clears throat> and secures consumer chains. I had quite a lot of calls with the Neutron team, with the Stride team, also with um, Noble that was just coming out of stealth recently. Um, and in fact, I think people still underestimate how that will change the game for Atom tokenomics, right? You talked earlier about it. Currently, pretty much all the rewards in Atom come from the emissions, right? Basically from the inflation, I think emission is actually a better term, but let's say inflation, um, which is a dynamic inflation packed to the, to the bonded ratio. With interchain security, Atom stakers and validators also are going to earn transaction fees, usage fees, and also in some cases emissions from the native token on that consumer chain, right? So let's say, for example, Neutron launches, and they already announced that they're going to have their own coin, their own token. Neutron launches. Neutron is a smart contract platform, general purpose, I guess, optimized for DeFi. Um, but general purpose, you can build anything on it. Um, they will probably have a DEX. They will probably also deploy Lido on it. If they have a lot of volume, Atom Stakers APR increases. And it doesn't increase in Atom. In Neutron's case, it increases in NTRN, right? So we actually earn NTRN tokens. Then we have Noble, which is another chain that actually won't have their native token as of now. Fees are denominated in USDC, which means Atom stakers earn USDC for staking Atom, right? That's a game changer, right? Like no, like Ethereum doesn't have that. Polkadot doesn't have that. Um, any other shared security chain doesn't have that. That in my opinion is a game changer because now you have an APR that is detached from the emissions of Atom, right? And it's not gonna be a big change when, right when it launches, right? We also have to like set expectations here. It's not gonna be like when ICS launches and Neutron goes live in Noble, we have 40% APR and like 20% come from liquid, from interchain security. That's not gonna be the case. It's gonna be slowly and gradually. We also have to see more and more applications that bring high traffic um, and decent products to the Cosmos Hub. Um, which is all governance gate capped, by the way. So um, the Cosmos Hub community will decide what applications they want to have on the hub. But I think, again, it changes the game for Atom tokenomics. It's a clear product market fit for the Cosmos Hub itself, which up until now has been a little bit vague. So if the question is Cosmos Hub as a chain, um, overrated, underrated, I think Right now, fairly rated with interchain security, that's going to change the game. And I think a lot of people aren't prepared, which is why I'm saying severely underrated. Um, I would say that like last year around that time, interchain security was a bit 
overrated, but just because um, I think people did not really understand interchain security back then. But also, I think that many people don't understand interchain security fully yet. Um, so back then, I had the feeling that many people were like thinking, hey, we will have 300 chains leveraging interchain security at one point. But this is like nonsense because um, for this also, we as a validator would be like, ext like we would face like a lot of challenges. We could simply not run 300 chains parallelly to the Cosmos Hub in the sake of interchain security. So this was like a misconception that the that interchain security would uh, support like 200 or 300 chains or so. Um, and it was also like presented as the all in one weapon for everything um, what, where the Cosmos Hub improved, where the Cosmos Hub could improve. So like back then, I think it was like kind of overrated. But now I think we have seen a shift that many people like don't really understand like the full scope of interchain security, which is what I've mentioned earlier with liquid staking, but um, also what you just mentioned with um, the with the USDC chain. Um, so there are a lot of things going on here. So this is the reason why I think that interchain security is also underrated right now, because I think since this Atom 2.0 discussion, people forgot to forgot what interchain security is really all about. Um, do you also think that, that that people like don't fully understand interchain security yet? Like lots of people. I mean, even I, to some degree, don't fully understand how it works. Right? Like sure. this is also very technical. But I, I, I feel like I understand the impact it has for the Cosmos Hub, for its positioning. And I also see it sometimes in the context of interchain security. People say, yeah, but if we have mesh security, ICS is going to be obsolete. But in fact, I believe that mesh security is targeting a different audience, right? Or a different um, use case, right? Which is more for existing chains. Um, existing sovereign chains that have potentially already high TBL and everything, right? They could use mesh security to be a provider and consumer at the same time. Whereas if you have a new product idea and you want to launch your new chain, probably interchain security for the Cosmos Hub would be the better way to go, right? Because that's where you have um, a, a very fast way to bootstrap your chain without having to worry about um, first, you know, building up your validator set and accruing a security budget and security level that makes sense for, for mesh security. So I think, you know, the end game will probably be mesh security, but that could also mean that the hub itself implements mesh security and interchain security at the same time, where interchain security is for new chains and the hub itself secures and uses mesh security from other chains in Cosmos. So, and then we also have Feather from the Terra um, space, right, which is coming up. Um, sounds also promising. I haven't done a deep dive on that. Um, that could be maybe a closer competitor to, to the Cosmos Hub Interchain Security. But I think also, you know, we have Polkadot, um, shared security pioneers, actually, by far. Um, I also think that space is still, um, there, there's, the, the pie is big, and there's a lot of market shares to still be distributed and redistributed. Um, but I think Atom is gaining more steam. The app chain narrative is gaining more steam. So I think ICS is going to hit and it's going to take the Atom to uh, the Cosmos up to to new levels. Yeah. And according to Van Eck, Atom to $1,600 by 2030. But no financial okay. advice, of course. No financial advice, of course. But if that will be the case, I will buy you a brand new Lamborghini, Mr. Cryptocito. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, with but friends, with a friend's handshake. Yeah, with the friend's handshake, like in yellow, and then <laughs> okay. the, the the black handshake. No, but yeah, you're completely right. Also, with um, let's be honest, what other shared security models are out there that are that advanced? Of course, mesh security, cool thing, but uh, I think it's not that advanced compared to interchain security. Um, it was like it became popular uh, during during uh, Hackwasm uh, that took place shortly after Cosmoverse in, in, in Colombia. So, like, without any doubt, Intergen Security is the most advanced shared security model in, 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 in crypto, I would say, right now. Like, I couldn't think about something else. Of course, you have, like, the roll-up mechanism, but I wouldn't really uh, take this into, like, I what mean, Ethereum is doing with the roll-ups. 
but I think there's no other shared security model like that is doing precisely that. I mean, I would like the, the leaders are definitely Polkadot and Kusama. Like they're definitely by far leading that space. But besides them, um, I always was under the impression that Avalanche subnets also um, inherit security from the primary network in Avalanche. But I was surprised to find out that's not actually the case. So subnets in Avalanche do not use shared security of the primary network. Parachains and Polkadot and Kusama do, and I think that's very good. Like that's a big use case for the relay chain in both networks. Um, but yeah, like you say, besides that, I think it's a very unexplored, um, untapped market. Um, I wish Atom already had it, but if it already had it, it will probably be already in the top 10, which means we still have that upside potential ahead of us. And yeah, we're gonna see how the market reacts um, once the proposal goes on chain, because there's going to be two proposals actually that have to go live before ICS is implemented. And then we were going to see a proposal from Neutron to, to apply basically to the Cosmos Hub community to, to consume shared security from the hub. So it's still going to take six, eight, maybe 10 weeks, whatever. But nevertheless, no, no matter Which when is it not comes, long. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was supposed to come in, in January this year. Um, like last month, but um, you know how it is in crypto, right? Yeah, like I think estimates. running two months late is for is in my world, in my crypto world, is completely on time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Oh, um, so, like also, I agree with you. Interchain security underrated. Yeah, severely underrated, in my opinion. Then let's continue. Cosmos governance now. Let us get the chilies out of the kitchen and spice it up. <laughs> um, Cosmos governance, uh, you wanted to bring this on. Yeah. Um, so can you like maybe specify a little bit what we want to talk about here? Um, so okay, that we so have like an overview. Cosmos governance, very short, because I also have to run in a few minutes, but very short. My thoughts in general, the big picture, severely overrated as of right now. And what do I mean by that? I mean that um, the Cosmos Hub community is discussing a lot of proposals, but I think there's also a lot of um, a lot of discussions that are leading nowhere. There's a lot of drama that comes out of it, um, and there's also a lot of debating about things that um, you know we as a community should rather leverage some synergies and not try to slow down development, right? And, and sure, it's always great to be a little bit skeptic. It's always great to be rather conservative, but we also have to admit, and we have to, you, you know, we have to recognize that crypto is a very fast moving industry. The competition is not sleeping, right? So I did my research recently on Avalanche and Cardano, for example, very big ecosystems, very strong brand awareness and recognition. They do not even have an on-chain governance framework. So they don't have any governance, right? And I think in Cosmos, we have a little bit of like too much governance in the sense that there's so many discussions and I guess like no one in Cosmos right now is up to date with every single proposal, not even on the Cosmos hub, right? It's just impossible. Like the amount of conversations, discussions, form entries, back and forth, YouTube channels, um, Twitter spaces, right? It's just like, time-wise impossible to stay up to date. So Cosmos governance needs to improve. It needs to get slimmer in my, in my uh, opinion. It needs to be more lean. Um, and I think there's a lot of initiatives and thoughts out there how we can do that. Um, but I think implementation such as, you know, what we see with Proposal 95, um, accelerated DAO to basically have sub DAOs that manage certain things that have smaller teams that can execute much faster is very important for the longevity and sustainability of the Cosmos Hub, because again, the competition doesn't sleep and there is certain things that the Cosmos Hub especially needs to move faster when it comes to business development, attracting new developers and, and just growing the community. So that's my thoughts, but uh, I'm curious to hear what you, what do you think? I couldn't agree more on this, to be honest. I also want to keep it short. Um, I think um, governance proposal 95, got a little bit too much hate. Um, again, I think I also had the feeling that people were like just waiting for it to throw dirt um, on the proposals. I also think that the 
for both of us not ideally written. There were like some questions ignored in the governance proposal. I also believe that. But still, for me, the, there is like a lack of leadership. Um, so I think we should, what you just mentioned, we should um, we should um, make decisions like much quicker since crypto is a very fast moving industry. And then also the thing is, like most of the times, there are a lot of people like talking and making most of the noise without being that involved. So just imagine that um, you are a country and a very complex economic decision has to be made. And we bring this economic decision to the broader population and ask for everyone's opinion and to vote on that. Just imagine this for a second. So I don't think that we should need to, you know, come together on all things and some like certain things also shouldn't be on the hub in regards of spamming. I still believe that um, governance proposal, I think 89 was it for cosmic validator to uh, compensate for media expenses or something. I think this proposal was also like just unnecessary. I mean, like while Avalanche and all the others are like moving so much quicker than Cosmos is doing it uh, sometimes, we are like bringing proposals on the hub to discuss whether we should bring $20,000 to the table to fund a small YouTube channel. Like, come on, guys, I think we have better things to do. So this yeah. is why I also believe we should we should do it. And in regards of Cosmoverse, we also did some proposals and then we are like in the position explaining to people how you should run an event, um, like to people who never organized an event. So I don't know. This yeah. Is I mean, that's the thing, right? Like there's two layers to it. <clears throat> the first layer is the forum discussions, right? And especially the people that are critics are very, very noisy, right? The people that just are probably not even that active on Twitter you don't hear from them, right? They probably just um, vote and that's it, right? But the, there's there's like a bunch of people that are just very noisy and very loud on Twitter and on forum entries. Um, that's one layer, right? The, the social layer. The actual layer that matters is who has, you know, how much voting power? What's the voting power distribution? I think there, you know, it could definitely be more decentralized, of course, but that's where it really matters. And that's where you can see um, what is the general community actually thinking about this proposal, right? Um, but I think this this first layer, the social layer, is sometimes quite counterproductive because that's where a lot of damage is being done. And, you know, it, it's very um, exhausting to engage with a lot of these discussions from, as you say, people that have never been to Cosmoverse, people that have never run an event to, like, tell us how to how we should run it. It's like, guys, like, please, you know, like we've done this two years ago. Like, that's the point of the discussion, right? And there's a lot of suspicion, right? Also around Atom 2.0, around Lido, when they did their proposal to fund um, Neutron, Neutron, basically, yeah. right? P2P validator. Um, so we definitely need some DAOs for that um, to just also offload the, the social layer. Um, but yeah, that's why I'm, th I'm thinking like currently, Especially if you zoom out and you look into other ecosystems, Cosmos governance is 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 a is a bit overrated. Um, actually, it's really overrated in that sense. Um, and we kind of like should step a little bit back. Um, less drama, less fire. Everything is going to be fine. Um, not everyone has ill intentions and wants to kill the hub and take all the atoms and all, <laughs> you know whatever. There's like some weird conspiracy theories sometimes. But yeah, that's my. Yeah. I, I just wanted to mention these conspiracy theories that I sometimes hear. It's like, wow, like oh, when I hear these theories on Twitter, like, um, hey, Zaki might do this and Jack is doing, is maybe doing this. Like you understand without these kinds of people, like Cosmos wouldn't be there where it's today. Why, like how, like how can you, like how are you able to bring such a thought, thought piece to the table? So, um yeah, so for me also, yeah. it, it became a little bit too extreme, uh, Cosmos governance, so also my opinion, overrated. But I know uh, we have to tune in very shortly um, on Crypto Cito's YouTube channel to watch um, Sp um, Splitting Atoms together with uh, Jack Zempelin. And um, yeah, if you want to follow us for more, um, yeah, feel, feel free to do so. Follow Crypto Cito on Twitter. Yes, yes. <laughs> 
Yes, the OG one. Um, yeah, follow CryptoCito on Twitter and also, of course, follow uh, StakeCito on, on Twitter as well as a friends validator. And uh, yeah, like also like one last thing before we forget that. Um, we also posted with Cosmoverse some addresses where you can donate Atom to if you want to support the victims of the earthquake in Istanbul. We are very, very excited about um, Turkey, the Turkish crypto community and Cosmoverse 2023 taking place in Istanbul. So yeah, if you feel the need of uh, supporting the community there, please feel free to do so. I think these are yeah. perfect words too. Yeah, also it's really, really sad. Like I, I was looking today, you know, what's going on in, in Turkey. It's unimaginable, like what they're going through and like entire city basically wiped out like almost 20,000 people. Absolutely crazy scenes that we've seen there. And like, if you go on a customer's account and also my account and you also amplified it, there's ways you can uh, donate. There's Cosmos addresses. We did our best to figure out to which organizations the money goes. As of our knowledge from the people that we also know on ground in Turkey, these are all vetted addresses. Um, they're legit, they're legit organizations, NGOs basically, um, so that the probability is extremely high that the money comes to the right place. Um, so if anybody wants to donate, um, you feel, feel free to do that. And yeah, this was cool. We should do this again, actually, every, I don't know, month, month. or something. Yeah. Yeah, I think okay. months right. is good. If the people want to see that, tweet about it. Uh let everybody know. And yeah, I gotta jump off now. But this was cool. Thanks, man, for setting this up. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, thanks for joining. And now everyone tune in for splitting atom on Cryptocito. With that being said, then I see you guys and I see you, Cryptocito, next month again. Until then, bye-bye. Bye bye.